The Cypher Brief, because national security is everyone's business. Rob Joyce is someone um, I have been lucky enough to have several conversations with over the years as he has kind of moved around in his roles at NSA in the White House. Um, Rob, welcome, and thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to be here with us today. Hi, Suzanne. Great to see you again. It's nice to see you again, too. I thought we might start off this conversation today uh, with a look at current events. You know, there are a lot of thoughts out there um, about Russia-Ukraine crisis uh, on everyone's mind. People have been kind of waiting for a series of cyber attacks that may or may not happen and, and preparing for these things, both in government and the private sector. I'm wondering, Rob, if you have any kind of insights on that situation that you can share with us or tell us kind of where your thinking is on that right now. Sure. So, so I think, you know, what we are in is an era of unprecedented threats. Um, if you look at Ukraine, they have been heavily targeted. Um, you know, I think um, there, there were some who were expecting um, massive cyber war and then a little disappointed because they didn't see um, catastrophic effects from that. And I would say there's, there's a couple of explanations. One, the Ukrainians um, have been under threat and under pressure for a number of years. And so they have continued to adapt and improve and develop their tradecraft to the point where they mount a good defense and, and equally as important, they mount a great incident response. And, and what we've seen are a number of wiper viruses, um, seven or eight different um, unique wiper viruses that have been thrown into the ecosystem of Ukraine and its near abroad. Um, and, and so they've had to deal with that. And if, if you look, they generally have um, kept up business continuity, government continuity, um, communication sectors um, in, even in the face of that pressure. So, you know, tip of the hat to the folks, um, both in the, you know, the Ukrainian um, uh, environment themselves and all the companies uh, around the globe who have surged to help them because, you know, a lot of the support comes from the cloud services, the managed security services and other things that the world is bringing um, to, to those Ukrainian networks and those of their allies. Um, at the same time, we did see um, a really sophisticated attack um, coinciding with the launch of the uh, of the offensive kinetic activities, and that was, you know, the the, the attack on the satellite services. And that again, um, interesting and unique for a couple of reasons. One, it was yet another example of the Russians behaving badly in the international cyber sphere. Um, setting up an attack where they didn't care who else was collateral damage. And, and those attacks spilled out beyond the borders of Ukraine and hit um, you know, innocent civilians um, inside Ukraine, but also out into Western Europe where we saw things like uh, you know, uh, energy windmills disconnected from the network um, where they were no longer able to control and monitor um, those activities. We saw wide swaths of businesses um, lose their connectivity to things that they trusted over those satellite links. Um, and, and in it was a deployment of, you know, a pretty, um, uh, a fairly complex technique to make sure that those modems couldn't just be powered back on and reconnected to the, uh, to the networks. They were physically disabled um, and, and needed you know, factory intervention to bring them back online. So, you know, substantial impact out into Europe to businesses and a lot of innocence. So that's why, you know, you saw um, the, the EU, the US and a number of allies join together to talk about that as, um, you know, just irresponsible behavior in the, in the cyber environment. Um, so, so that's kind of that world. The, the other piece we see is, um, you know, continued, uh, targeting and focus from criminal actors, and and that is um, that is a rising trend globally. Uh, the sophistication of um, and specialization of criminal actors. You have groups who just specialize in initial access now, and will sell that access um, to others who then try to monetize it, either de deploying ransomware or um, you know holding. Um, that information as blackmail 
uh, to, to try to generate funds. So, so on both sides, we have this unprecedented threat with cyber actors from the criminal side and the nation state side just, just upping their game um, at a time when we depend more and more on that technology and our global interconnectedness. I'm a little bit nervous um, at understanding that, but I think it is, uh, you're better prepared if you know what's going on. So um, I think you've given us a really good list there. You know, you mentioned um, that there was this uh, outpouring really um, by private companies uh, when Russia first invaded Ukraine that was very helpful. However, um, I know you were recently speaking um, at UK Cyber Conference and, and mentioned that there's a line there between being helpful and vigilantes. I wonder if we could just spend a quick minute on that and, and kind of hear your thoughts on where that line is and where your company might be helpful versus when you're getting into territory that's actually more damaging. Yeah, the, the helpful was what I was talking about um, in the companies that offered um, you know, security services and, um, you know, new capabilities for monitoring, detection, and defensive activities. Um, the, the thing you're talking about, I was addressing the call for vigilantism, right? People to rise up and hack back. Um, and, and that actually is problematic because, you know, you, you look at Colonial Pipeline where we suffered a, a major attack on U.S. Uh, businesses here in the U.S., a U.S. business um, that took physical supplies of gasoline um, off the network um, and, and made it unavailable for a, a good portion of the East Coast of the U.S. Um, that emanated and originated out of Russia. And, and so we had work, um, you know, across the diplomatic efforts, the White House trying to, um, you know, convince Russia that they need to, needed to act on criminals inside their borders. Um, that becomes a really hard conversation um, if nations can turn around and point and say, well, you're actively encouraging or allowing people to attack us. And, and that is, you know, that is a legal activity by U.S. law and something that, that law enforcement does pursue. And, and so, you know, well, well, they're good meaning and, and, you know, well-intentioned, um, and, and you know, a piece of you wants to root for those guys who are who are fighting the good fight. Um, it, it really do, does become counterproductive to some of the bigger national strategic efforts um, as people decide that they're going to just uh, become a cyber mercenary and join the fight. I think it's helpful. Um, I appreciate your your candid response. I think it's very helpful to understand kind of where those lines are because, as you mentioned, I think people sometimes have good intentions and just really. Um, aren't understanding the interconnectivity of the space maybe as well as they could. You, you also mentioned that there is a rise in uh, criminal actors. And I'm wondering if we can go a little bit more in depth on that. We're gonna be talking a little bit later today with the FBI about what they're seeing on their radar for global cybercrime. But ransomware is something that um, has not gone away, uh, doesn't look like it's going to go away. And businesses are still really struggling with how to deal with that. I, I wonder if we could talk a little bit more about how the NSA is supporting the private sector on the issue specifically of ransomware. Sure. Um, you know, so the first thing we do, um, we have a tremendous capability in our foreign intelligence mission. And, and so we use that to help inform law enforcement um, as well as the, you know, major cyber companies who can do something about tools, infrastructure, and capabilities. So where we found we have benefit is when we can do something at scale. If we can illuminate infrastructure, and then either it can be the function of a law enforcement action, a government action, or um, the, the, the owners operators of that infrastructure, um, recognizing that it's malicious and then being able to pull it down. Um, but what we've also found is the seeds of that information that we understand through foreign intelligence then blossom into this big garden when, um, when the infrastructure providers um, take that and they use their data, their uh, position in the ecosystem to then develop it further. And, and so that's a really powerful cycle um, where when we know something that they can then build on the data that they own they possess and, and take action underneath their um, underneath their corporate banner. Um, it, it really moves at speed and scale much better than one-off activities where you might go after a single incident. Mm -hmm. 
I wonder too, I just want to remind everyone if you do have questions that you'd like to ask um, Director Joyce, please go ahead and, and use the chat box and the control uh, box on the right hand side of your screen to shoot us over those questions. I wonder if I could just ask, uh, um, you know, about a year ago, we interviewed um, someone from the Department of Justice who told us that they were seeing trends that cyber criminals were sometimes working, you know, cyber crime at night and nation state related during the day. Is that kind of consistent with what the NSA is still seeing today when it comes to the interconnectivity, if you will, of cyber crime and, and hackers? Yeah, there, there are definitely people who um, who work by day, um, you know, for a nation state APT, and then who get to use either the tools or techniques um, to try to do individual profit making um, on the side. And, and at times that makes it uh, a little difficult when, you know, analysts are chasing these nation state activities and then they see a, a side detour um, into a company that has no intelligence benefit, um, but then later turns out to be a for profit hack. Um, you know, I, th I think, as I mentioned, the, the interesting development we're seeing is um, the, the rise in just the number of ransomware events across the past year. But also, interestingly, we have seen a recent decline since the Ukrainian invasion. Um, and, and, you know, there, there are multiple contributing factors um, to that. Um, you know, one piece is likely um, the, the work that CISA and the rest of the government have done with their, um, you know, just awareness campaign, Shields Up, where people recognize this is an elevated threat and they've been paying attention and, and putting more energy into defense. But another part of it is we've definitively seen the, the criminal actors in Russia complain that the functions of sanctions and the, the, the distance of um, their ability to use um, credit cards and other payment methods to get Western infrastructure to run these attacks has become much more difficult. And so we've seen that have um, an impact on their operations and it's driving the trend down a little bit. Certainly hasn't solved it, um, but it's nice to see something in the, uh, in the ransomware world um, on a positive trend. Um, so when the NSA is putting out some of the advisories on some of the things that you're seeing along with um, CISA and your FBI partners within government, um, I understand that um, NSA puts these things out, these cyber uh, advisories on the website. Can everyone use these? Yeah, they are. I increasingly, you will see multi seals on these um, advisories. So, you know, depending on um, what the sources are and how it's built, um, you know, you will see one, two, five, sometimes even internationally eight or nine seals where multiple entities are contributing. You know, it may be that in the case of uh, something specific, we will do the bulk of the work, but, um, you know, it, it is shared information throughout that whole ecosystem. And, you know, all of those are publicly released and then hosted um, at, at multiple places. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're following the, the CISA releases, um, we'll push all that information out through there. So I think I mentioned off the top that I've known you for a number of years. Um, I was fortunate enough to interview you, um, I think, I don't know, six or seven years ago now. Right? We've been at this a long time. I'm wondering now what's top of mind for you as you look to the future, because you've seen how these trends are evolving. You've seen how the government is working more closely with private sector and vice versa. I'm wondering like, what's top of mind for you as we look for the next year to five years, perhaps, just in terms of trend lines? Yeah, so top of mind is um, cloud security. So there's real benefits to, um, you know, moving things into the cloud. Um, you know, if, if you are a small startup and you don't even have an IT staff or a CISO, um, trying to roll your own security, um, it is really hard to get it right and stay on top of as technology changes, threats emerge, new, um, new zero days are dropped on the market. Um, and so there, there is a huge benefit to getting into the security ecosystem of one of the large providers that has a dedicated staff that does all that for you. And then as you move from five people to 50 people to 500 people, you know, they, they can scale and, and, and continue to grow. So all of that is, is amazing. Um, the, the thing we're still wrestling with a bit now is how do we 
Um, how do we understand the threats in that ecosystem? Is uh, it's a little bit of a black box. And so, you know, a number of years ago, I gave a talk, and you know, one of the one of the things that got picked out of that was the comment that you know that another name for the cloud is somebody else's computer, right? It just there's no magic there. It is, um, you know, somebody else is owning and operating and securing and architecting um, that ecosystem for you. So, so you're putting a lot of trust in them. And, and I think that's something we've got to continue to work on is, you know, while they are professionalized and they have resources and that is an awesome structure, um, how do we continue to make sure that, you know, they are at the top of their game and, and the information from, um, their operations then can continue to shape the ecosystem to get to get better and more secure over time. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question from one of our attendees here um, who asks if you can comment on the impact of the rise of cryptocurrencies on the overall cybersecurity landscape from your perspective. Yeah, well, it's it's no secret cryptocurrency is an enabler. Um, you know, I won't I, I won't make a value judgment on you know, whether the good outweighs the bad, but there is no doubt that, you know, uh, anonymous payment services allow and facilitate um, ransomware and cyber extortion and other things. Um, so, you know, we continue to, to pursue the ability to, 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 to understand where the payments are going, who's using them, how they're laundered, and, uh, you know, how the criminal ecosystem is paired with this, um, the, this, side ecosystem that allows them to cash out right very clear that you know north korea um ha has invested in the business of cyber crime and and using that cryptocurrency ecosystem um to to avoid sanctions and so that just kind of shows you that you know there is one channel for cryptocurrency and capabilities that enables some of these activities mm -hmm. Uh, we have another question here. How do you see the software supply chain problem being fixed is the question. That's a big one. I'm going to ask you how you see the software supply chain problem impacting the national security mission. Yeah. So um, we've had a number of software supply chain attacks in the recent years that show nation states are waking up to the chance that a single victory in that supply chain can lead to multiple operational victories. So SolarWinds is a great example, right? It was an intent to move upstream, um, uh, exploit a device that is in the trust ecosystem, and then leverage that into the, the, the collection, the operations um, that, uh, that they wanted to achieve. And so, um, you know, software supply chain is an increasingly important piece of work. Um, I, I applaud a bunch of the open source foundations for really looking and tackling that problem. Um, it, it isn't just an open source problem, though, but it is one where if an adversary recognizes that there is an opportunity to inject a vulnerability, um into something you've put inside your ring of trust that then they can continue to propagate and so for us um you know one of the one of the sides is to protect and secure the software supply chain um, but another side of it is to um, make sure that uh, single um, single wins against your software stack um, don't turn into operational wins. And what do I mean by that? I, I mean, you know, leveraging most of the principles that we think of as, as zero trust, where you have belt and suspenders around individual gatekeeping um, uh, across the access to data or operational activities um, really improves the supply chain. Um, I I, oh, go ahead. I, I, I will highlight, you know, one additional trend that, that has me pretty concerned it's the, the speed to weaponization. Um, so if you see a new zero day announced and dropped, um, you know, that's always a reason for concern. You know, there's usually a CVE score and people assess how important or risky it is. For me, the, the thing I pay most attention to is, is there a proof of concept in the wild? Because I can tell you if there's a proof of concept dropped with that vulnerability, 
at that point, the exploitation makes a hockey stick um, shaped graph and just explodes. Uh, first to market are usually the Bitcoin miners um, and, and they will sprint in and, uh, and, and try to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, think of them as a leading security indicator. If you find a Bitcoin miner based on one of those, um, you know you have bigger issues and you better, you, you better get the security team um, taken care of and locking you down because the next thing that often comes um, is ransomware or APT activity. And we are now seeing, you know, people move really fast. Um, they, they will target and understand their victims' environment and what technology they're using. And, and in the nation state capability, we saw somebody recently wait um, for a vulnerability in a piece of technology used in a government, um, in a government network. And then they were able to quickly and rapidly use that um, once um, a vulnerability came on the market. And so that time from known um, vulnerability um, is not as important as a proof of concept available because then the, the world dog, dog piles onto that vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, speed. Uh, yeah, the speed is uh, obviously something that you, you mentioned is top of mind for you. And I know then several conversations I've had with folks in the private sector. Um, is another issue. Let me get to another question we have here um, from Charles Faulkner who asks, he says, the CISA director has talked about making cyber risk a coffee table conversation. It's clearly a boardroom conversation. And you just said even you and your team are trying to understand the ecosystem. What is NSA's role in educating the public and its stakeholders on cyber risk? And what's the way forward, he asks, for bolstering cyber literacy and, un and understanding? Yeah, so, so that's a great topic and, and one we're pretty passionate about. Um, so, so the coffee table conversation, you know, I'm primarily looking to CISA, right? They have that huge, massive job of, you know, the, the being the, the, the protector of things in critical infrastructure, as well as the unclassified government space. NSA has a more niche and focused market. Um, what I take advantage of is that, you know, because we are not as broad based, um, uh, when we talk about something, usually it has some pretty good pickup and impact. So I try to focus on things and messages that really need to get out there. Um, if you follow my Twitter feed, you know I'm not tweeting about every CVE that crosses paths, but when I think something's going to move the move the needle in security, um, often I will uh, I'll repeat it. And, and so trying to be very focused and tailored. As far as more um, broad impact. Um, it absolutely has to start with education. One thing NSA is doing is we have the Gen Cyber camps where we um, sponsor um, a series of summer camps um, for students and also educators. So we not only directly um, bring kids in and expose them to um, cyber careers and cyber technology, um, but we also bring in teachers during those summer camps who can then go incorporate those lessons into their curriculums. We supply curriculums, we do grants for underprivileged sectors uh, of, uh, of the communities um, to host these camps. And so firm believer that, you know, we've got to get diversity into cybersecurity. Um, most of them look like me, right? You know, older white males. If we just balanced so we had equal female representation, that would take care of a lot of our shortcomings um, in the, the quantity of, of cybersecurity talent but we definitely need diversity um, across every number of facets because um, you know, the way we see cyber criminals often succeed is the way we as a nation state succeed in our SIGINT mission, right? It is thinking about finding something unexpected um, and then taking advantage of it. And that diversity of thought helps you in, uh, in defending and coming up with new solutions. And it's going to continuously be this arms race. And so we have to have that diversity of thought to continue evolving the way the, uh, the, the criminal actors are. And you're the second, um, the, our second guest of the day and the second person to bring that issue up. So we know how important that is. Um, we have a question here from Kelly Bissell, who is now taking on a new role at Microsoft in cyber. He's also one of our SIG principals. Um, his question is cybersecurity is a boardroom conversation but very few with cyber knowledge. How do we get better boards to hold management accountable for these elementary lapses, which allow breaches and ransomware? Everyone's talking about this as well. Yeah, 
That's a great question, Kelly. And, and you know, my belief is every significant board ought to have somebody of cybersecurity talent on it. Um, I, I am I am afraid of making that a mandate because then you'll see people just go to the checkbox and they they will grab um, you know somebody who has uh, resume credentials but maybe not the passion or the experience. But, but I find the boards that do have somebody who's been through, um, you know, a significant cyber event or has been um, involved in, the, you know, understanding just how pervasive and unrelenting the threat is to go in there and, and bring that experience and ask hard questions to, to try to drive um, investment. And, and usually that's what I see in this area is cybersecurity. We know how to do good cybersecurity. Um, it usually comes down to a resource and a focus uh, and, and where you have an advocate on a board that then drives the attention, the focus, and the resources uh, to do the right thing. Usually you wind up with a much stronger outcome. So uh, uh, unfortunately, I think the ransomware um, scourge is having a good positive effect in this area because many companies as they do the risk register are bringing ransomware into that discussion, which then has the board say, how do we know whether we are well secured or not? And they look for that expertise, both on their teams um, and at the board advisory level. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Glenn Gerstel, who you know well, um, former NSA general counsel, and Glenn is also one of our SIG principals we're going to be uh, hearing from later today. He says, Rob, what's your view of the future of sector-specific versus centralized regulation? Um, great question, Glenn, and, and uh, good morning to you as well. Um, I, I believe sector-specific agencies have an insight and a relationship with the entities in that sector that a generalist will never have. So they bring an important view. But, comma, um, I think it's very important that we harmonize um, the regulatory space. Um, you know, uh, the ability for regulators or a spe sector specific agency to diverge a bit um, and, and, and then make it much harder on companies that might have multiple um, sectors or regulators um, or, you know, have that, uh, that, that joy of being an international company where you have to worry about, you know, different state laws, different national laws, different regulations, it, it just gets really onerous on the companies. Um, so, you know, what I'd like to find is some core baseline um, where the generic things are all similar, um, and then you, uh, you you branch out where it really is only a sector-specific reason um, that there needs to be a differentiation. But, but you can't underestimate the relationship that sector-specific agencies have with those in their sector. That is really a powerful, uh, powerful tool. I think this has been a really practical conversation and I really appreciate you taking the time um, to talk with us and share some of the th these things. We are gonna be sharing uh, your Twitter handle, I think is already in the chat box, um, the NSA website where people can go and get some of these advisories so that there's an actionable component to our conversation today. But let me just ask you in closing, um, what didn't we talk about that uh, that's top of mind for you right now? Um, we, we talked about it a bit, um, but that's advocacy. Um, you know, if people are here, they're, they're probably already in the echo chamber, they get it. Um, but it's trying to figure out how we get the adv advocacy for cybersecurity to do the right thing. So in my role at NSA, one thing we're focused on is, you know, just making the Department of Defense uh, a harder target in cyber. And, and you know, we, we intuitively understand the networks will be under threat. Um, not everybody intuitively understands the vulnerabilities that are in weapon systems and, and the vehicles we depend on and things like that. And so it, it is building that understanding and we do that um, to find you know, senior leadership that can be advocates, that, that the light bulb goes on and then they're willing to put that investment in to make sure whether it's a business continuity or a critical infrastructure or a or, or a national security imperative that they're all covered from that cyber threat. 
Rob Joyce is Director of Cybersecurity at the National Security Agency. We want to thank you very much, Rob. It's great to see you again, and, and we really value your time today. Thank you. Thanks, Susan.